So welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our MFA in writing and publishing student reading. And uh, we are absolutely delighted to welcome our first and second year MFA in writing and publishing students to read their work this evening. Each of our students has worked hard to produce poetry, fiction, nonfiction, playwriting, screenwriting, and craft criticism during their tenure at VCFA. And we're proud of all the work that they have produced in our program, in the MFA in Writing and Publishing program, as well as in the Certificate in Publishing program. Tonight, each student will be reading for about 10 minutes from their current work, and each student will introduce the reader after them. So I'd like to introduce our first graduate student of the night, M.K. Martin also known as Molly. So M.K. Martin is a novelist, editor, and word, nor word nerd extraordinaire. Her short stories can be found in Wanderlust, Barnstorm, and Hunger Mountain. Her novel is available through Amazon Bookshop or at other indie bookstores. So please welcome M.K. Martin. Thank you, Rita. Um, Dexter just totally threw me off again as per Dexter by holding up a copy of my book. So um, <laughs> um, my what I'm going to read tonight is not necessarily exactly from my work in progress, but it's a spin off from the world that I'm working in. Um, I've written a bunch of short, short stories to kind of explore that world um, in more depth. So we found Emily along the road. She was wrapped in a dirty bedsheet and clutching a Zippo. Three months, and she's still not really talking, but she doesn't flinch whenever we get near her. So progress, right? Jen and I sit on the roof of the van as the ragged red sun slinks away. It's afternoon, but night comes early under the ash clouds. Skeletal trees stretch bare branches towards the rainless sky. The sky hoards her moisture and the earth lies barren. Emily stands in the field, the faded green of her sweatshirt stark against the straw yellow of the dead grass. A dust devil dances across the road, a twisting funnel of ash and topsoil. Both Jen and I look over our shoulders towards the west. Most of the dust storms come from the scorched graveyard that used to be Los Angeles. It's already too dark to see much other than the lightning flashes. I call Emily. She doesn't respond. I jump off the van and trot over to her. A storm's coming. We got a scoot kid. The wind catches up with us, shaking the van as we pass the junked out shells of cars. No telling why people pulled over and left their vehicles here. The world is too full of mysteries and we have too few answers. So we make uncomfortable peace with ignorance. We exit the highway at, at the town of Castle. Most of the buildings have already been scavenged, windows smashed. Over there, I direct Jen to a Victorian sheltered by a windbreak of browning pines the kind of place where historical societies used to meet. We exit the van and the wind slashes us with needles of sand and powders us with ashy dust, soft as talc. It gets into everything, ears, mouths, collects, in the mud in the, collects as mud in the corners of your eyes. The wind is so strong we have to push off the side of the house or be crushed. The inside is cool and clean. The wind rattles the windows demands to be let in under the doors and through the cracks of the foundation, screams down the chimney. Jen and I laugh as we shake out the dust. Emily brushes a hand through her shaggy hair. Don't shoot. We jump at the man's voice. Jen and I both draw. An elderly man steps into view, holding up his hands. Dame's Jerome, he says. The boy and I have been here since, well, he shrugs, since they evac the town, said there was a collection point back east, but we were waiting on the boys' folks to come back. Jen and I exchange looks. We know how this story ends. Will you stay for dinner? Jerome asks. And I can't help but laugh. He smiles too. His smile is quick and easy, not rusty like ours or missing like Emily's. We've got peaches, Jen says. I can't remember the last time we sat at a table with real plates and silverware. The boy, DeWalt, helps himself to seconds of the sweet, slippery, marigold peach crescents. DeWalt wants to go looking for his folks, he tells us. Jen and I make non-committal noises, and Jerome pats the boy's dark, fuzzy curls. After dinner, we spread our sleeping bags on the living room floor. We give Emily the couch. Jen insists on searching the house, and I stay with Jerome and keep the boy in sight until she comes back. 
Jerome doesn't mind our caution. He lights lanterns and gets out a book. DeWalt joins him on the couch and Emily leans against the arm. Jerome reads aloud about the goddess Serdwin and her children, one hideous and one beautiful. Serdwin brings rebirth, transformation, and inspiration doled out from her cauldron like soup. After Jerome and DeWalt go upstairs, we listen to the cacophony of the storm. Jen reaches over and slips her hand into mine, our fingers intertwined. With so much going wrong in the world, we steal a moment of bliss, our own eye in the, of the storm. Around us, the dark house groans and the wind sputters out the last of the storm's fury and gasps and gusts. I don't know if it's the light or the silence that wakes me. The storm is gone and there's nothing but the ticking of Jerome's grandfather clock from the hall. The ticking and a crackling. I sit up. Red, red orange light flares outside, not lightning, raiders. I shake Jen and scramble up. My pistol holster hangs from one of the cart, couch's armrests. The couch is empty. Emily is gone. I don't think. I run. I'm barefoot, but I don't feel the gravel in the drive as I spin and spin, searching for Emily, for the raiders. The firelight flickers in the side of the house, and I sprint that way. At the corner, I stop. Emily and DeWalt stand hand in hand before the conflagration. The windbreak trees burn. I'm drawn moth-like to the flame. The heat caresses my face. The fire reaches for the sky, the smoke and embers dancing up to join the clouds. We're making an offering to Serdwin, DeWalt says. His eyes glow like coals and he watches the destruction with hunger and curiosity. Why? I hear the rustle of Jen's footsteps and I wave to let her know we're all fine to bring the rain. Emily's voice is soft. Oh, kid, listen. Thunder crashes. Something hits my face. It's small and cold and wet, but I'm not crying. We turn our faces to the heavens as the rain falls. Jen screams and dances in ecstasy and I join her. We cup our hands and drink, anoint ourselves with water from the gods. In the morning, Jerome and DeWalt pile into the van with us. Emily hums as the miles file fall away behind us. She puts her hand out of the window and swoops it through the air and smiles. Thank you. All right. And I have the pleasure of introducing our next reader. Let me see if I can pull up. Thank you, everybody. So I'm introducing Eli. Um, I got to, got to know Eli a little bit in a couple of our publishing classes. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more of what she's got to read ahead of us. Eli Jacobs is a Maryland-based writer, poet, and first-year student. Her work has appeared in multiple student journey, journals, including AACCC's Amaranth and SMCM's Avatar. In 2017, her short screenplay, Neptune's Daughter, was awarded Best Script East Coast Division by the Community College Humanities Association. Please join me in welcoming Eli Jacobs. Hi. <laughs> I never know how to like respond to being introduced. Um, but uh, thank you so much uh, for having me today. Uh, I'm going to be reading from um, my novella that I wrote for my undergrad thesis. I, funny enough, kind of stopped thinking about it once I started grad school, kind of had felt like that I've been there, done that. And then you guys all uh, brought my passion back for it, honestly. So it's still it's not going to exist in this form. I know that, but I still like this uh, selection for you today. She was tangly haired, talkative and eight when her mom woke her up in the middle of the night. Gil was curled up in her bed, the brightly colored sheets keeping her warm. She woke up from a hand shaking her by the shoulders. She blinked up at mommy sitting at the foot of her bed, confused. She was confused because the world outside her bedroom window was still dark. 
Mommy's long hair was neatly brushed and it looked so soft and silky in the moonlight. Gil reached out and touched it as she sat up, wrinkling her nose sleepily at Mommy. What's going on? Her mom was dressed in a white cotton nightgown that made her look like she had walked right out of a moonbeam. Mommy kissed the top of Gillian's head with a smile and spoke very softly. I wanna teach you something, Guppy. Something my mama taught me when I was your age. The idea of that excited the little girl, still half under her sheets. She bounced up onto her knees. What is it, what is it? Gil asked at full volume. Shh, it's late. Let's not wake up daddy or Kip, all right? This is just for you and me, okay? Mommy stood from the bed and gestured for Gil to follow her to the door. Like a secret, Gil asked, lowering her voice and following her mom. Yep, a special secret. Mommy took her daughter's hand as they both tiptoed barefoot down the stairs towards the living room where the fish tanks burbled. But how come it's a secret? Why can't you tell him? Kip tells me everything. He's like five now and that's pretty big. So I think he could tell no, not tell nobody. And, and daddy is super good at keeping secrets because he didn't even tell Mrs. Grover I didn't do my homework when she called. So I think we should do it as a family, mommy. Secrets aren't no fun if you can't share them with anyone, right? And at the bottom of the stairs, mommy turned and knelt so that their eyes were level. Gil's own green eyes were reflected back to her as if instead of mommy's eyes, she was looking into large mossy pools encircled in dark rings. That's very sweet of you, Gillian, but this is just for us girls. I want it to be special. Is that all right with you? And Gil thought about it. She nodded, yawning. I guess so. What are we gonna do anyway? Gil's mom led her into the living room. It was a cozy room, each wall packed tightly with tanks of fish, large floppy couches and armchairs and rows and rows of bookshelves. I'm gonna teach you how to swim, her mother said, smiling. There was an excitement etched into the wrinkles stirring the form on mommy's face. My Gil's toes tingle with a sense of mystery and adventure. Uh, I already know how to swim, remember? Daddy taught me when we were little. Her confusion made mommy's la mommy laugh. No, honey, not that kind of swimming. Uh, not that, not that kind of swimming. Not the kind where you wiggle around your arms and legs anyway. It's, it's hard to explain. Come here. Mommy had a stool pulled up next to a, long, a big, long, rectangular tank brimming with brightly color, colored aquatic life. She stepped up onto the stool and carefully lifted off the lid, the lamps, anything that was impeding, impeding the way for her to stand completely in the tank, her toes burrowing their way into the neon pebbles. Gillian stepped up onto the stool, watching, but not climbing into the tank alongside her. She peered through the glass at Mommy's big toes, which picked poked out of the pebbled floor, wriggling almost like they were fish themselves. She giggled. You're not big enough to swim in there. Mm-hmm, Mommy nodded, but her eyes were closed. She seemed to relax into the dark shadows cast by the blue tank lights. Guppy, watch closely, okay? This is what I'm going to teach you. Her mom knelt down on her knees, her white nightgown billowing out around her and then flattening out as if it was weighed down by the water. Then mommy started melting. There was no horror in the sight. Her whole being just seemed to start flowing, melding with the water, bit by bit until even her red hair had turned liquid and all that remained of her mother was a little blue fish. Its large black eyes stared up at her, unblinking. It was smaller than Gil's pinky finger and it swam around a, in a little triumphant circle. And she knew without a doubt that this little blue fish with her, was her mom, that there was no difference between the forms for her, no disconnect. Gil jumped up and down with glee, clapping her hands together. That's so cool. I wanna try, I wanna try. Mommy seemed to rise up out of the water as if she was standing up from a much deeper point. She was absolutely beaming, fish swimming in circles around her ankles. Well, then get in here, Gups. The young girls clambering over the side of the glass. It felt like trespassing. This was a home for her pets, but not for her. 
normally she would never be allowed to stand in the warm water with her flannel pajama bottoms clinging uncomfortably to her legs. She nervously shifted around, getting used to the feeling of the pebbles beneath her feet. What do I do now? Close your eyes and take a big, deep breath. Mommy placed a hand on Gil's shoulder, guiding her so that she was crouching with only her head out of the water. She squeezed her eyes shut and tried to focus only on the sound of her mom's voice. It's not working. Just relax, let the water wash over you. Don't think about it as your enemy. Don't think about it as something's going to hurt you. You have to work with it. Forget that your body and the water are two separate things. Mommy's voice was so soft and airy, it drifted around Gil as if from a dream. She began to feel a strange tingling at the tips of her fingers as she imagined herself melting. It was a sort of feeling each, sort of like feeling each part of her body fall asleep at different times, like slipping into unconsciousness while somehow remaining awake. She lost feeling slowly, lost track of where she, her face was, where her arms were, forgot the shape of her elbows, the feeling of air moving in and out of her lungs. Her eyes were forced open and she forgot how to blink as they took in a whole new world. She could see mommy looming large above her, most of her body a distorted image wavering along the surface of the world. Gil's body now was something else entirely, sleek and scaly and iridescent. Her fins were the vibrant red that her hair had once been, now more useful, more powerful. She swam in circles around her mother's legs, shimmering in greens and golds. Then she moved beyond, gliding from one end of the tank to the other, burbling out little bubbles of greeting to her fellow fish. Gleefully, she flitted, drunk on this new feeling. It felt like she was flying. It was so easy to move. Each flick of her body was way forward washing water over her gills to her, fill herself up with the energy she needed to keep going. Every part of her, every minuscule pulse was free, was new, was unconcerned with the world beyond the glass. Gillian could have forgotten she was ever human at all. Then a pair of giant hands plunged down and scooped her up and the touch of skin made her remember. Suddenly panic gripped her at the thought she had almost forgotten forgotten that she was not a fish, but a little girl, that she had a mommy watching her and a daddy and a little brother and his name was Kip and both of them were fast asleep in their beds. She had almost forgotten that she loved them. What it felt like to hug them, to hold her family close against her human body. Gil sprouted out from the little fish body in a frenzy of flailing limbs. She cried out as she flashed back to her life, her chest heaving to draw air back into her lungs. Mommy reached for her and Gil pulled her into her arms, and pulled Gil into her arms, holding her tightly against her chest. Shh, get but guppy. It's okay, quiet now, don't panic. You did absolutely wonderful. Gil relaxed into the embrace and looked up at her mom to see that mommy was crying. What's wrong? Why are you sad? She asked, twisting around to hug her mother back. I'm just so proud of you. Mommy said, but Gil could tell that was a lie. Something ached behind Mommy's eyes. Something about Gilling, seeing Gil learning to swim, made her not just sad, but in pain. And she saw for the first time that there was, and always had been, as long as Gillian had been alive, a piece of her Mommy missing, and she didn't know why. She lacked the words, the wisdom to ask. Thank you. Uh, and I now have the pleasure of introducing Nina. Uh, Nina is a second year student in the writing and publishing program, is a cross-genre writer from Pittsburgh, and, she, and is a cross-genre writer from Pittsburgh. Sorry, I've been talking too long. <laughs> she especially loves the strange and unusual in literature, and she's also passionate about the questions, including, or especially, the political and metaphysical that literature can ask. Hi everyone, I'm gonna read um, a super short story and two poems and I timed it so it's just under 10 minutes. Um, all right. A whiff of blue, can everyone hear me properly? Okay, good, just checking. <laughs> a whiff of blue, 
The stale air of the train was less putrid than usual, a relief I basked in as I sought my seat, one of the few without still damp, unidentifiable stains coating the withered blue. I settled down for the ride, my legs relieved at their temporary vacation. I, just, I dreaded uncovering the many blisters and cuts that I was sure now adorned, now adorned my feet, the price of a 12-hour workday in new stilettos. I settled my messenger bag on my lap and pulled a book from its front pocket. I glittered my fingertip with my warm tongue and opened the book. As the doors closed and the train jolted forward, I sank into the pages like they were the fathoms of a spa. Ugh, that book is so stupid, said a voice accompanied by a breath of moldy French onion soup. I glared at the culprit, a man in a creased suit complete with golden tie clip and well-polished briefcase both bearing his name in scarlet letters. I looked away, willing myself not to whack spurious Otto Blossington III over the head with a book he'd so disdainfully accosted. Thankfully, Spurious decided to sit down then out of reach of my arms. The subway plugged along, pausing briefly at the near empty viaduct way station. I let myself fall into the words on the page, their narrative seeping through my neurons, exhilaration and tranquility, born together from crunchy syllables, only in a book. I didn't notice the person beside me getting up, nor the new person taking their place. Not till a cacophony of foil and plastic flipped my eardrums did I look up from my book to see a wrinkled hand uncovering a pie. Yes, the elderly woman sitting beside me had taken a whole pie from her bag. She had pushed the plastic bags holding it away and was now peeling the foil from the top from the moment the foil left its place, I could feel the prickle of tears in my eyes. I coughed as silently as I could, trying desperately to return to the scrumptious words I'd been reading, but nothing in that moment could compare to the tender, sweet, like a good day aroma of blueberries and sugar and perfectly browned crust. Want some? asked the woman. The world trembled in my tongue, my tongue tingling with something greater than lust. No, thank you, I croaked. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Sir Spurius III smirk at us. It was with the utmost pleasure that I watched his jeers sag into revulsion. Then I heard the chewing, though I would hardly call it chewing, more slurping. I turned back to the woman beside me. She had scooped a chunk of pie up with one of her bare hands and was shoveling it into her mouth. Pie innards, the color of boysenberry blood, decorated her chin then her chest, then her lap. Bits of crust flaked back into the pie dish and I was instantly nauseatingly glad I'd resisted the lure of that dish. I should have gotten up. I should have just started away off the train. I should have dashed home to my bed and my shower and maybe a shot of vodka or two to forsake the memory of this horror forever. But even as the woman reached her slimy blue hand back into the dish and rested another handful of blueberry spit pie from its home, I found I could not leave. My book hung lazily in my left hand as I gawked at the woman. People all around me were shuffling away. One woman diagonal from me moved her newspaper further up her face, though her eyes flitted over the top every now and then. Some of the passengers fled at the next stop, Leaf Street, but others remained, taking turns to speed glance at the pie woman and at each other, never making eye contact with anyone. Then, as the train sped away from the cobblestones of Leaf Street, which could have been my sanctuary, a gravelly voice piped up. Woman, can you eat that somewhere else? You're making everyone sick, Spurious sputtered. Oh, sorry, the woman replied in a bored voice. She licked her hand several times and wiped the remaining pie guts on her jeans. Balancing the pie on one leg, the woman reached into her bag, rummaging beneath the plastic until she withdrew her prize, a bottle of rosé and good rosé at that. She twisted the cap off. Cheers, the woman held the bottle up to Spurious before placing it to her lips. I felt my eyes stretch as the woman began to practically evaporate the rosé. When she finally brought the bottle away from her mouth, no more than a minute or two later, more than a third of the bottle was gone. Spraya stood up. You're a disgusting woman. What kind of person eats and drinks like some animal in public, ruining all of our days? Spurious pulled a tissue from inside his suit jacket, wiping his face as he cringed and gaped. See, the thing is that Spurious had a point. 
My stomach was still churning. Drying blueberry goo crumbs and now trails of rosé were caked about the woman's face. Her clothes were a mess and so was the area around her. Yet my eyes were still soft, my heart still pounding from that initial wave of saccharine perfume. There are few things that can jar a soul or ignite an old memory, an old feeling, quite like a smell. What I saw in that perfume were figments of black and white photographs, a mahogany table, a tall clock painted with cats, and a woman strumming a banjo. It wasn't until the train slowed for the next station that I realized I was shaking, reacting to the emotions radiating my atoms. Lost to a whim, I reached over and plucked a single mushy blueberry from the pie. I stood up, heaved my bag over the sh my shoulder, and flicked the berry. It found its mark just as the train stopped. Spurious smudge, Blossington III, read the now plum gold tie clip. Oh, sir, I am so sorry. Here, why don't you take this as my apology to you? I shoved Alice in Wonderland into his hands. I turned to the pie woman. This is my stop. Want to come with me? She nodded. I helped her to quickly gather her things and we hopped off the train. What's your name? I asked. Elira, the woman replied. That's a beautiful name. A tear tickled my cheek. And then um, this next piece, it's a, a poem that I wrote um, that's meant to complement the story that I just read. It's called The Ones Who Dream. When stars fall from the roots of trees and the moon kisses the sun like a hawk kisses a bee, where is the heart that flutters at the rain? The eye that gushes at cerulean fields? The woman who bathes in the snow and eats ivy vines that curl in our eyes? Where is the musician who saves our lives but sulks beneath the footprints of Hydra? When the whistle of a palila beckons a dragon from the fingerprint of a nebula and a thought congeals time and a word fractures our soul, we need the ones who see in pink, who dapple it with our curdled dreams, who withstood our hackles and smacks and smirks and snorts and condemnations. They were never daisies, they were always the sun, and we likened them to hair on a foot. When the day is still, and the night ripples, and the ocean butters the sky with the blood of earth, where are the ones who dream? And then this um, next poem, which is the final thing I'll read, is not related to either of the previous pieces. The flavor of fuchsia. One moment. The flavor of fuchsia. What is the voice of blue? The waves of a wrathful ocean? The breath of a departing telephone or the chorus of sapphire slivers against the sinews of the sun? What is the taste of violet? The repulsive delicacy of a petal or the acrid prick of counterfeit fruit? The death of joy that brittles the palate or a blazing kinked photon drinking you like a hummingbird bat? What is the texture of dreams? If not the brush of sandpaper against the cosmic cry of a magpie gutting a dormouse's threnody, a note threaded through an impossible eye with a nose on her tongue, an ear on her finger, a tail in her head. And that's all. Oh, and I'm introducing Sarah next. Um, next, I'd like to introduce second, fellow second year student and my friend, Sarah Stancliffe. In her work, Sarah blends elements of poetry, creative nonfiction, literary collage, and memoir. She is excited about, she is most excited about the intersections of creative writing, social activism, and body healing and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And um, wow, what a joy to be here tonight at this reading. Um, I need to like talk a little bit because my nerves are like so fluttery right now. <laughs> um, I love these things. The graduation was so beautiful earlier and um, and being in this space with all of you lovely people means a lot. Um, <sighs> okay, I'm gonna read a short piece of creative nonfiction and then I'm going to read a bunch of my very short um, poems which were made using um, magnetic poetry kit 
Ridge magnets. Um, thanks to Molly for giving me some of those magnets and to Rebecca for giving me her mini bridge on which to make the poems. Uh, um, all right. The first piece is called Do You Take? Hold on, let me drink some tea. Mom asks me over to look through our old Barbie bins and see if I want to keep anything. I'm 27. I haven't thought about dolls in years. Nude rubber Barbie bodies soak in the soapy sink and wet heads lay out to dry on a towel folded into itself. I reach for a brunette doll who once wore a purple gown and I'm 10 again. Becca and I finally agree on what Barbies are getting married today. My Ken and her newest Bratz doll, even though she used her last time we played wedding. Of course, the doll Becca named Tiffany is stuffed into the wedding gown mom made us with lace from her fabric basket. Ken looks sort of dressed up in the shirt cut from one of dad's gold toe socks. That mini skirt is for my Bratz doll, Sarah. It looks dumb on yours. You don't have to have a cow about it here. I never get to use the cool clothes and I should get first pick because I'm older. Our whole bridal party, including my favorite, little Lella the flower girl, is all decked out in the best stuff we can find. The bride and groom go in the white convertible with no back seat and the rest of the dolls sit in the pink camper van with their legs crisscrossing over each other. Becca takes the car, I take the van, and we drive them from the cold linoleum playroom floor onto the rough hallway carpet and down the stairs and around mom's feet in the kitchen and down the two wide wooden steps into the family room where we have the venue set up on the red and brown stones of the fireplace hearth. The dolls whose legs splay out wide can sit upright on the floor, but the ones with straight bodies tip over, we lean them against each other. Becca and I stand Ken and Tiffany on the hearth face to face and recite the words we know from all the church weddings we go to. I wish we still had the lacy wedding veil that somebody lost. Whatever. It probably wouldn't even fit on this big brat's doll head anyways. Do you take this woman to be your wife as long as you both shall live? I do. We make the dolls kiss, their feet coming off the floor sideways. It's never exciting to me, not like the kiss at real weddings. After the ceremony, the married couple gets back in the convertible and I shoot the car across the smooth kitchen floor until they crash onto a table or chair leg on the other side. Usually when the wedding is over, we're done playing and we just put everything back into the bins. At 10, I don't know yet about marriage, sex, all that comes after a wedding, compromise, betrayal, abandonment, divorce. The brunette doll is strange in my palms. I'm suddenly aware of her pert, bitty nakedness and don't know how to handle her body. I take nothing from the Barbie bins. Um, next, I'll read some poems. Um, these are titled with the date that I wrote them. Um, I've played around with giving them other titles and I just don't know what to do. So there, the dates. All right, this is 2118. These days, the wind moans and whispers on raw skin. I dream when the black diamond sun sleeps. I trudge through shadows beneath a bitter blue sky. I watch for the ugly shine above always rusts into sweet, rosy spring. 7, 14, 18. Lake water heaves over rock bed. I sing to the sky, my feet in the blue, a sad language, a whisper beating from my breast. Ugly goddess of love or lust, no less my mother, though you crush me, and the soaring, delirious, repulsive need I have to be one. I want the dream, not to run away from storms, not some quick summer worshiping of skin and never using up a life with wanting. I ask you, shadow woman, 
Show me how lives are put together. Can I sip some tea? By the way, um, I'm stealing from myself and I'm going to, I'm planning on calling my thesis project how lives are put together. So nobody steal that from me. Um, the next poem is 11, 29, 18. He slinks away. She aches for something never hers. I watch and would whisper my affection and urge to dress her in yards of pink sunlight, let her sleep across my lap on this soft sofa and picture a girl's dream of almost. I love me in love. She thinks music and says so, springs about with drunk and curious feet, smells the sea spray of better places after rain. I want her always. She gives quick long kisses, fiddles with frisky fingers, catches every companion storm and pets it smooth. I'm afraid to break her beneath all my bitter. But after my boiling blood cools, our breast beats. Tiny, quiet, beautiful. Together we are perfect. 11, 15, 19. Though you toy with this ship and you lick at these ears, tongue drunk in my sails and swad at my full moon light, break raw beats that paw at my lap, your fingers afraid of what runs sleek, still, I litter eggs of rock and rust. I clean my home with mother blood. I chant and moan my want, the rant and roam I want. I want the dream, the life, this shadow woman I've always been. Every black cat scream, my mad girl symphony, ugly goddess, she. 8520. We've been through this together almost every morning. Harmony is asking us over to place thought above friendless urges toward mess, to make peace, to make lives. I try adding the language of coffee love. Begin with worshipful roast of reason, grind smooth, Pour steaming affection over. Let's sit, snooze, imagine, percolate. See this brew spirit into change and want it. Bring enemy and friend, like a pot of milk, a cup of sweetness. One home to another, mind to mind. Be good company. Share your best and freshest. 92720. I rip my hair into tiny pieces. I let my dress fall. Ask the ache to please go too. Mind liquid sugar in a caffeinated head, the face a mug, frothing tongue, mercurial breast and boiling arms, smoking, bare. Fingers fiddle, paw, swat at nothing fur like a cat or bear, whiskers. Empty eggs drop safely through quiet blood. A luscious butt soft with indecisive meat. This stalk beneath skin a rock to sit presses sad and raw. Feet stir long shadows. The spirit is a sea tiger. The voice black forest moon. Imagine being able to change. What is the language of body? Some days a goodness, always home. This apparatus, my companion. And this is the last poem, 11, 30, 20. Quite fresh. <laughs> Some novel thought comes to me Picture this, I move through the world, chasing romance, 
changing my life for love. I need beauty, so I see chances in all things. Full dreams of discovering another fashioned from fiction fall short. Grown girls and boys become little villains in my poems. My pages ache with when, why, how, what does it mean to play, to crush, to please? I find this still a mystery. Yet now I place my body into the story. How do I know her wants and needs? What is the description of her character? Urges come and go, those little dramas. I begin to recall my questions, answers. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. If everyone would like to unmute, let's give a, a round of applause to all of our readers tonight. Thank you to Sarah and Nina. And uh, you know, thank you to Molly and Eli. Uh, thank you for all of our audience members who have come today, our alums, our current students, mm -hmm. friends and family, other members of the VCFA community, our faculty. Um, it's an honor to be with all of you guys tonight. Um, thank you for celebrating our students in their graduation and in the end of the semester reading. I wish you all a wonderful and very healthy and happy holiday season and a luminous new year. Um, and if you would like to unmute and say congratulations and do a round of applause, let's do that right now. So thank you so much, guys. Yay! Awesome. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Also talented. No. No. So good to see all of you guys. Um, just a quick reminder that our spring semester will kick off on January 19th. We have a wonderful guest on February 5th, uh, Felicia Rose Chavez, who's doing an anti-racist workshop um, that's open to all of our students, faculty, staff, and alums. So if you'd like to join, uh, let us know. I hope to see some of you guys there. In the meantime, happy holidays, happy new year, keep in touch um, and go forth and write well. Good night. Okay. Bye. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Happy Congrats. Bye, everybody. So nice to see you. Good to see you too, Rebecca. Thank you too, Rebecca. Yeah. Good night, everyone.